The world is filled with physical processes and systems that we would like to record, monitor, process, and ultimately store for some useful purpose. In this video, we'll give an overview of how electrical signals can be created that relate to these processes and systems. We'll also discuss how these signals can be modeled for use in designing electronic systems to interact with these physical systems. Every electronic device from cell phones to magnetic resonance imaging systems involve the generation, processing, and production of time varying voltages and currents that we will refer to as signals. The time variations contain, contain information of interest that must be preserved, processed, and ultimately teased out into useful forms. These signals may arise from transducers that convert non-electrical physical quantities into electrical properties. There's a vast variety of devices that are designed to convert the non-electrical property to a physical or to an electrical property. They're referred to as transducers. And there are transducers that will convert just about any physical property out there that you can imagine. They sense properties such as pressure, temperature, pH, impedance, velocity, sound waves, and electromagnetic waves. These transducers may be either active devices that produce small voltages or currents, or they may be passive devices whose electrical properties, such as resistance or capacitance, change and thus respond differently to an externally applied voltage. Other signals may be intermediate voltages or currents found within a larger electrical system and may move from one stage to another in a sequence of operations performed by the system. And finally, these signals may be the final product of the system and are used to drive some other non-electrical system. These time variations of a signal are generally related to some physical property and embedded in this signal's amplitude, phase, or frequency spectrum is information about the physical property that is of valuable interest. We can model these signals as either Thevenin equivalent or Norton equivalent sources. You'll recall from our study of Thevenin equivalency that the Thevenin model consists of a voltage source in series with a source resistance, while the Norton equivalent model consists of a current source in parallel with a source resistance. Generally, we can model the signal with either a Thevenin or a Norton model. While any signal can be modeled as either a voltage or a current source, the Thevenin voltage model is frequently used when the source impedance is low. And in fact, ideally, we'll see, ideally this source resistance is zero. And the Norton model may be more useful when the source impedance is large. Again, ideally, an infinite source impedance. Now, presumably, this source that we're receiving and are interested in is going to be processed by something. And whatever it's being connected to, we're going to refer to it as a load. When the load is connected to a model of, or to a source model as a Thevenin source, or to say it a different way, when we're, mo <clears throat> when we're modeling our source in a Thevenin form, a Thevenin model, the load then introduces a voltage division between the voltage source and the load. Or to put it another way, the voltage that ends up at the load will be a voltage divided portion of the actual signal voltage coming from the transducer. On the other hand, if we're using a Norton model, the load will introduce a current division, and the current being developed by the transducer then will be modeled as part of it going through the source resistance and the rest of it going through the load. In addition to the amplitude of the signal, signals are also characterized by their time varying nature. This time variation is conveniently noted or observed in the frequency domain in terms of the signal's frequency spectrum. As we've seen in our study of Fourier series analysis, periodic signals have a spectrum consisting of a discrete, of a discrete frequency spectrum, where the fundamental frequency of the periodic waveform dominates and higher harmonics or higher frequencies of that periodic signal die off in amplitude. You'll recognize this as an example of the frequency spectrum of a square wave where only the odd harmonics are present. 
Yet this frequency spectrum represents a, a fingerprint or a, a characteristic of this time varying signal. Aperiodic signals or signals that don't repeat in time can also be thought of in terms of their frequency spectrum. In the case of aperiodic signals, the frequency spectrum is a continuous spectrum defined over all frequencies. So unlike the periodic signals, which had frequencies only at discrete values, aperiodic signals are defined over a continuous frequency range. For completeness in our discussion of signals, let's briefly discuss analog, digital, and binary signals. An analog signal is a signal that is continuous both in time and amplitude. Generally, signals arising from natural processes will be analog in nature. An alternative to the analog signal that allows digital computers to process these signals is a digital signal. These consist of a sequence of numbers or samples sample values of the analog signal taken at periodic intervals. Every delta t seconds, the analog value is sampled. These sampled values are then assigned a digital code or a number to approximate the relative size of that signal at the time it is sampled. By sampling frequently enough, a reasonable representation of the analog signal is obtained. But this sample value will always be an approximation because the analog signal is continuous over, t over its amplitude and can have an infinite number of values. But the precision of the digital number is limited to the number of digits we can allocate to represent the value. This approximation results in what is known as quantization error or quantization noise. The devices that con convert analog signals to digital signals are known as analog to digital converters or ADCs. They produce a binary code or number assigned to a range of continuous values of the analog signal. The precision of the ADC depends upon the number of bits used to represent the analog value. The greater the number of bits, the narrower the range of analog values assigned to the same digital value. In our example here, each sample is represented by a 4-bit binary code. With 4 bits, you can represent 2 to the 4th or 16 different values. In this case, all the values of this analog signal that varies from about, uh, about minus 7 volts to plus 7 volts, a little bit more than that, will be assigned one of the 16 different binary numbers. In this case, the value of the analog signal the first sampling period, so right along in here, here's our analog value, it's sampled at that first sampling period, and you can see that, it, that the value of that analog voltage is somewhere between Oh, what, call it 5 and, let's see, between um, 5.5 and, and 6.5 and volts. And values that map within, or values within that range of analog values map to the binary number 1110. So the first sample, or the value of the analog signal, in that time frame is represented by the binary number 1101. During the next sampling, or at the next sampling period, the value is somewhere between, what is that, 6.5 and 7.5 and volts, which maps to the binary code 1111. And thus it continues, sampling every so often, every delta t seconds, and with each one of those samples then, another in this case, another 4-bit binary code is associated with it. This string of binary numbers, then, is known as a binary signal, and the computer itself can think of them in terms of binary or can represent them in terms of a digital number, but at any rate, this sequence of numbers represents the analog signal of interest.